Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel. And hey, look, I've got Victor Oliver with me today. Hello, Victor. Hello, back again. Well, it's irresistible to have you back, um, especially <laughs> as I spotted that you are giving a talk at the Astrological Associations Conference, which is between the 23rd and the 25th of September. I should say, from the 23rd to the 25th of September. Mm -hmm. and your talk is Draconic Astrology in Sinistry. So I thought, hmm, let's hear about that. <laughs> well, what a wise person you are. I mean, <laughs> it's quite a subject, I can tell you now. And it won't be for the faint-hearted, because it's called Why I Married My Ultimate Nightmare. Why are we drawn to someone who will sink us into an abyss of vitriol? That's what it's all about. And of course, the starting point for this approach is that even in the horror relationships, you know, like the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp, and Joe Lee and Pitt, Princess Margaret and Sir Sid and Nancy, which literally led to horror that there may yet be a spiritual purpose to the encounter, to wake up portals, blah de blah de blah And what I thought I'd do, I mean, this is not going to turn into a lecture today, you'll be relieved to learn, and we can carry on conversing. But I have actually put together a few charts about Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden, and I can give you a little preamble to their, their horror relationship, if you like. Well, that that is brilliant, and I really... I like the way that you put that because ultimately relationships should be about learning. And sometimes we learn in a very pleasant way and sometimes we learn the hard way. And funnily enough, um, I've been giving a course on relationships, on synastry and, and composites um, in the last month. And it's actually continuing. Um, but when I, I think it was in the very first um, class, I said to the group, remember that you meet God in the other. So that person that is giving you a hard time or that person that you are finding very, very pleasant, that's, that's your encounter with God. And what I meant by that was exactly this, is that we, we grow and we learn and through relationships and that there are some relationships which are fated, they're appointments with fate. And, and those are the ones that are going to be, bring about the most significant opportunities for growth and hopefully um, won't end in disaster all the time. But we, as we know, and the ones that you're talking about, um, we'd have to check in with them in their next life to see how <laughs> what they got from this particular lifetime's big relationship. Of course, the evolution can occur within this lifetime, as you know yourself. Hopefully it does, so you don't have to then carry the karma of it to another time if, if one accepts that uh, as a reality. Um, and of course, there is a side to this uh, subject where you're not absolutely certain what the effect was. All you can say is, well, there they are. These are the known circumstances of the relationship. And then they did something else when they split up. Usually they split up. They very rarely stay together. Although, fun enough, I was thinking about the film Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf um, this afternoon with Burton and Taylor. I've got a picture to show you in a minute. And of course, that couple stayed together through the sharing of a dark secret. And the power play in keeping that secret as a pointer, as, an, as a sort of um, a weapon, if you like, intrigued me. Um, so that I might, act, I mean, there's not going to be time in my talk for the AA to, to go into all of that. And today, all I can do is to touch on the subject and give some people pointers about how you would approach this draconically. I love that. I, I really do. And Yes, you're, you're obviously quite right when you, you say evolution can happen within a lifetime. And I think I was thinking of the more dramatic ones that um, end rather unpleasantly. Oh, with yes. <laughs> I was thinking of the proper tragic ones. Um, but um, 
but yes, most thankfully, most do not end in, in great tragedy. Um, they, they just are somewhat dramatic in their end. Yeah, well, noisy. I mean, you know, uh, our, this year, apart from Ukraine, um, but, but it, the news has been dominated by the Johnny Depp Amber Heard uh, case in Virginia. And I think that was quite remarkable because maybe for the first time we saw from start to end a public demonstration of a war between two people. I mean, I'm not getting into the rights and wrongs of it and saying whether what she did or what he did and all that stuff, you know. But as an as a play out, as a as a you know as a in life in life reality demonstration of what when things can go horribly wrong, it's going to be quite intriguing to examine their draconics, which I will be doing at the Astrological Association conference. If you think of when you were talking about two people at war, that film War of the Roses. Oh gosh, yes. Well, that's quite a film. That's exactly. marvelous. I mean, there are plenty of these battle zone films, you know. Of course, the films don't want to get boring by looking at the spiritual purpose of it all. They just want to get the the innards, you know, it, with fireworks coming out of people's bellies and things like that. So now I'm all excited. Let's see. Well, let's let's get to the. Uh, I'm going to share the screen, and you'll have to guide me on. Uh, whether I'm getting it right size-wise. I'll just make it bigger. I mean, what I can do is to turn it into... Uh, get rid of that margin. There we go. That's a bit bigger, isn't it? And yeah. I'm going to reduce the dialogue box and put it in the corner. So, of course, what we're looking at here is not Princess Margaret and Lord Snow. Tony was... Um, uh, Lord tell you what, though, I'm not looking at the chart. If that's what you're looking at, that's not what I'm looking at. Oh, I'm looking just at a picture at the moment. Can you yeah, see that? Yeah. Yeah. I can um, see the picture. We'll jump. That's that's a chart. Can you see the chart? That's the chart. Yes. Yeah. I can. But uh, this is just the starter. You know, to whet the appetite. Not that we need to whet appetites. But that's a scene from um, "Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf?" Elizabeth Taylor screaming at Burton, um, and uh, it's just a bit of dramatic eye candy, you know, why I married my ultimate nightmare. So, I mean, with Sinistries, as we both know, we're examining two charts and um, we're looking to see compatibility where the strengths and weaknesses lie. It's not about pronouncing that the relationship is doomed or otherwise, although I think some relationships are more likely to be challenging than others, shall we say. But then if you can have a relationship of trines and that could lead to total boredom. So it's, it, there isn't actually astrologically, in my opinion, a definitive way of deciding whether a relationship is likely to work or not. One can only say that, oh, you've got a, you've got a few minefields to go through, or, or it's actually going to be quite happy in certain ways. So what you do, um, uh, if you'd like me to just talk through the process. I mean, the thing about Princess Margaret and, um, the man who would become Lord Snowden. He was a photographer, society photographer. She was the Queen's sister, um, Queen Elizabeth II's sister, just in case people don't know it. And um, very much uh, the spare, so to speak. And she entered into this marriage with Lord Snowden, which soon disintegrated. It became very vitriolic. It started off being very passionate, but then it disintegrated in adultery, addictions, and goodness knows what else. I think when we're examining even the draconic synastry, we've got to start with the tropical synastry. So what we're looking at here is Princess Margaret's tropical birth chart. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go into a great exploration here, but I, I'm just going to point out certain characters. And by all means, interrupt me if you want to make an observation, Anna. I mean, it's a highly cardinal chart. She's got the North Node in area. So this is a woman used to having her own way. And my goodness, she's got a very, very sort of fixed chart. She's got a balsamic moon, which is interesting. So that's quite a mature emotional starting point for what is a pretty immature sort of energy that's driving her at the head sort of level. Um, uh, the Venus is good on the descendant, I think, in Libra. It's quite a strong uh, Venus. Um, the sun is dissociate conjunct Neptune, which I think we will see becomes a problem uh, particularly in relation to illusion and addictions. Um, funnily enough, I'm not, I'm not going to show the draconic chart. Draconic, of course, shows the spiritual purposes. But in her draconic chart, there's no cardinal energy at all. It's almost as if life is asking her to be less headstrong, less initiatory, almost to 
uh, defaults to a kind of flexibility, which she could never do. And we'll see uh, how that manifested in her life. I was just looking at that moon Pluto conjunction as well. And, and I was thinking about how, how fixed that energy is because Pluto is pretty determined to get his way, as we know. Absolutely. And it's very in, emotionally intense as well. So although we might have that fire somewhat uh, muted by the conjunction to, to Neptune, mm. there is incredibly intense energy. Um, there's, a, there's a rigidity, isn't there? It's almost, yeah. and that was a feature of her life. I mean, she was immovable on many different things, uh, it, particularly in her, um, I mean, she was quite bohemian in some respect, but when it came to the family, she uphold, upheld the traditions. She tended to, her esteem was linked very much to status and the family. Of course, when we talk about the family, we're talking about the royal family. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, she's got Jupiter in that fourth house. Indeed. And, indeed. You know, and, and there's that moon Pluto conjunction in the fourth house. So... Yes, that, that's big. That, I mean, it's quite literal, I think, of what we knew of, know of Princess Margaret. Shall we have a look at Lord Snowden? Um, he, he was called Anthony Armstrong Jones, and then he was ennobled because he married the Queen's sister. Um, now, in contrast to her chart, which we saw as highly cardinal, his is highly pronouncedly mutable, highly adaptable. And that, that had a literal sort of thing about his sexuality, too, because... It was fairly well known that he was bisexual, even had bisexual relationships and heterosexual relationships during the marriage. That doesn't mean that all mutable charts mean that you're mutable sexually, but actually within the, within the understanding of astrology, it, it's consistent. What's interesting about him is that he has a locomotive chart with Saturn leading, and you see that a very strong Saturn in Capricorn. So there was with him, um, quite a strong sense of his own structure, of his own gifts and his sort of relationship with people. And that was his leading planet. So we immediately see a slight, probably a likely problem with um, a very cardinal chart like Princess Margaret's, although we'll have to see when we compare the charts, what that actually means. Um, we see also that uh, Mars is rising. We saw that she has Aries rising. He has Mars rising. That always worries me a little bit <laughs> when you see it in two charts. Um, North Node has stability themes, it's next to Chiron, which is interesting. Uh, it's a crescent moon in Gemini, so this is a much younger type moon. Um, there's a greater need to explore the world in a way that Princess Margaret didn't really. Hers was much more of interior exploration. And when you look at his cardinal chart, we see that um, cardinality is more emphasized. So he's being encouraged to be self-initiating and to, uh, in a sense, you know, um, take the initiative. And I think one saw that as his life progressed. I think he kind of just fell into the marriage because it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. And it was a very sexual relationship as well. Interesting that he's got um, the moon Jupiter conjunction in the fourth house as well. Absolutely, so absolutely. Her, her fourth house there. It's very interesting, isn't it? But of course it's, it's not so anchored um, it's in dear old Gemini, so he was always going to waver and wobble and, <laughs> and look about. I, that's how I would put it. Um, and uh, let's have a look where his Mercury is out of interest. So, yeah, we see it in Aquarius. Again, it's another air sign. It's um, in a, yeah, I mean, uh, he's got Mercury there too. Interesting, he's got Neptune um, near the setting point over on the Descendant. You know, he was a photographer. So uh, that, that thing with optical illusion and so forth comes in, that's quite relevant, but also quite diffuse in his relationship with the world. And I think that had a literal expression in the number of things that he did and in other ways besides. Is there anything else you, you'd like to say before I move on? No, I, I like you, I was looking at that Mars um, so close to the ascendant. Mm, mm. Um, I mean, their confrontations were epic. Uh, apparently, the, I mean, I've read a couple of books and it was, they were very inventive to each other in terms of insults. I must repeat some of them when I give the actual, if I include this as an example in my talk. I know this is a bit of a preamble, um, but, uh, you know, I always, if, if the thing works once, it will work twice. That's what I say. 
Um, so in her draconic chart, cardinality is missing, mutability is very high, her challenge is to be more flexible, more adaptable. She never was. She, uh, she never really fulfilled her draconic purpose, from what I understand. And his draconic chart, cardinality is more emphasized, the challenge is to be self-initiatory, which I think we did see to some extent in his, um, in his profession as he grew more famous and successful. So what we're looking here is the tropical oh. industry. Um, I'm sort of hearing an echo on myself. I don't know why, but never mind. It, it's, I'm not too worried. Now, because they were born in the same year, there's going to be some similarity between the nodes and the outer planets, as you can see. Um, the Neptunes, for example, are very close to each other. Um, which shows a certain commonality between them on a generational level, shall we say. But there are other themes besides. I mean, I just want to pick out a few things. Um, the, the fire, uh, the fire, sun, Neptune square, his air, moon, the risk of romantic illusion. And I really do think that they had a heavy illusory sort of relationship in the beginning. Um, his Earth Saturn is opposite her water Jupiter. Again, there's something restrictive about this. Um, I'm speaking a little abstractly because we don't have time to go into the biography. Now, in my, I don't know about you, Anna, but increasingly I'm using Black Moon Lilith. I find it is very, very articulate. And it's not a celestial, as we both know, it's a, a sort of mathematical point to do with the movements of the moon. And it's very interesting, look where it sits on Mars. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, uh, Lilith tends to have to do with concealed things, power. It's sometimes related to female power, but I don't know whether that's misogyny or whether the myth bears it out. Maybe it does, I don't know. But we all have Lilith in our charts. So I really do think it has something to do with taboo. I think it has uh, something to do with sexuality and the need to explore and expose. I think it has a Scorpio sort of feel to it, as a, as, as a although it's actually an Aquarius. But uh, conjunct Mars, there was always going to be the danger of great volatility, combustibility, and also the triggering, triggering of sensitive points. Um, the air Venus is square, his Earth Saturn, again, that's not the happiest of aspects in a sinistry. Um, his water Venus is square, her air Mars. And we have all this conflicting energy, which in a healthy relationship, is the food for growth, because you're having to challenge each other's differences to see how you can work them into your life and vice versa. So I interpret that even if I didn't know whose chart it belonged to, I would say that there's high combustibility. I find it interesting too that her son, if you look down in the fifth house, is sort of surrounded by Neptunes. Now, of course, that's a feature of the generational similarity between them, but it so happens this is astrology. So there seems to me to be a highly illusory, possibly addictive thing about this relationship. But of course, like a lot of addictions, they would tend to fall apart after a while as they become health threatening, shall we say. And it's all linked up um, with, with her son. Now they're out of sign, of course, but that actually adds to the problem in that you have contradictory energies between the, the royal Leo and that um, very, I wasn't gonna say prosaic, but I don't mean it that way, that earthy analytical Virgo. And all that energy is being muddled up together. So there's something there where they're yeah. feeling illusions, don't you think? Particularly yeah. for him so I, I was just thinking about Lilith and what you were saying about Lilith. Yes. And, you know, I, the image I have of Lilith always is fury. Yes. And it's, I don't know, I, I can't, I can't really say the difference between rage and fury <laughs> in, in using language, but to me, they have a, they feel different. Rage feels different to fury. And it's just, uh, I think that conjunction to Mars. It's outrageous, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's, um, I, for me, Mars is is just this simmering anger that is explosive, but Lilith to me is just yeah. this constant, constant fury. Um, that's well, the feature of their relationship. Yes, they scarcely bear each other's presence. And look, look if you look in the third house, Anna, if you look at uh, Princess Margaret's third house, 
all that energy we've just talked about is is in a kind of try uh, sort of <laughs> muddled up trine to mars and the ic yeah yeah so th there's a family element to this too um let's move on um so now we're looking now we're getting to the business now that we've looked at the tropical energy we're now entering unknown territory <laughs> which is we're now introducing the draconic perspective now the thing to know about draconic is that we're looking at a moon-based zodiac so we're not going to necessarily define things precisely as we would in the tropical although the themes are similar but we're looking for the, the kind of spiritual dimension. And just to look ahead, Anna, I'm going to look at the two charts where what, what's the draconic purpose on her tropical and what's his draconic and what's her draconic purpose on his tropical and vice versa, because you can play around with these charts. The first thing to notice, this is where I think draconic works so well. You can't get away from the Lilith Mars conjunction between them tropically. But look, the, the, the draconic chart wants to tell us something more. Lilith now moves closer to his ascendant point. So, and it's in Capricorn. So we don't take away from what we saw in the tropical. What we see is that there is something about the persona. There is something about the structure of him that provokes this ire, this fury or indifference, whichever way you want to look at it, whichever, however way you want to it. And when I see points or planets coming closer to a key planet or point in the other chart, I know that there's a definite nudge in our att attention, being brought to our attention, that it's refining the point because that's a stellium you're dealing with. So Mars is still involved, but this time more focused on the ascendant point. Um, a major theme here, I'm going to read what I've read, read there. A major theme here is the disconnection between status and emotion because of Capricorn. Um, it's allowing, and the problem with the uh, a Capricorn can be allowing emotion to be healthily expressed. There is the problem of trusting the wrong person or not feeling safe in the relationship. Something in the draconic chart is indicating um, a dysfunction within relationship itself as a theme. Um, one potential purpose of this union is to find independence within it or to unlearn the self-defeating habit of entering a bond for status or other materialistic reason. Um, opposite, if we look to her Neptune down in the fifth house, that's the inner will, her Neptune shifts to Cancer. Um, wait a minute, is that right? That's not right. Why did I say Is it that? Leo? It's, um, yes, it shifts, sorry. Yes, it shifts to Leo. Sorry, I was thinking tropical. So it, her Neptune shifts uh, to Leo, um, which is a more literal demonstration of her actual situation uh, at some level. It also brings themes of fixity and um, Theatric, theatricality as well. She herself was always into singing and playing and she wanted to act. She even made a film, uh, an informal film with Peter Sellers, which you believe. Uh, she had an affair with him too, but that's another subject. Um, I got that slightly wrong in my notes. I was thinking something. I was thinking of um, Lord Snowden's. Uh, yes. Yeah, he's got Neptune yes. and Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, but the, the, the basic themes remain there, but it, it, even, I mean, they would do, but the, the shifting of the signs is interesting in that it's interesting that after a while, it said that she found him quite boring <laughs> because in her fixed wonderfulness, she wanted to be constantly entertained. And at the start of the relationship, that's precisely what he did. He then defaulted to his actual personality, which is driven by that very strong Saturn. So he's taking life very seriously. He doesn't want to be playing all the time. And he was known to be a workaholic and she rarely saw him. So th that was one of the reasons why um, she fell out of love with him. And she had a number. I mean, it's not it's not gossip to say that she had a number of uh, relationships outside the marriage. Um, as I summarize this, the overall sole purpose of this relationship is to find emotional authenticity and to understand the damaging power of fantasy. That's because all that Capricorn energy in the 11th is opposed by all that muddled energy in the fifth house, which involves the two Neptunes. And 
it's almost as if they were drawn together to create a horrible collision between reality and fantasy or the power of the mind to dominate through illusion. This union raises the risk of addictive behaviors. She was alcoholic uh, as well. That's a kind of mundane sort of interpretation of the aspect. And I would say more likely to default to fantasy and emotional problems if there is a determination not to face realities. It's interesting too that the nodes, the moon's nodes are both at nought Aries there. That's the draconic nature of it though. Yes. They will always default to the, to the cardinal points in yeah, the conic. But what's interesting, you do make a good point there, that it's on the relationship axis. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking also. It's, I think that's quite significant in itself. It, it, it's where it's falling there. Um, and also, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I was also thinking about that Lilith on the Ascendant but being in Capricorn. Uh, it, it makes me feel like a cold fury, you know? Yes. Yeah. A cold war, except yes. it was quite heated as well, because we, we can combine the tropical manifestation, as it was seen, with the underlying actual problem. And really, it was a collision of... In many ways, I think they both suffered with emotional expression. But in her case, it was explored by from the theatrical perspective of her sticking to what she wanted. And he stuck to what he wanted. But of course, when you're trying to make Leo, uh, or you're trying to make um, uh, Capricorn energy work with an opposition, I know it's not strictly entirely oppositional, but because you've got cancer there as well. But when you're trying to make them work together and you've got Lilith bang in the middle, and so in between them, so to speak, it's almost as if they're triggering areas of themselves which they've scarcely addressed until they have the relationship but then what it does is to disrupt his sense of reality and also give her the chance to actually understand the difference between what there is in front of her and what she wants there to be in front of her yeah it i think looking at this it just what brings what comes to my mind is as you it, as you, you've said, the, the illusory aspect combined with such strong Mars, Lilith, it's the anger of, of not getting what you want. Yes. Um, and it's, it's maybe it feels like anger over unrequited love. And we can call it anger, we can call it fury, we can fall, call it rage because it has the quality of all three, whether it's due to, to Pluto, to Mars, or to Lilith, it, it's you've got every possible um, exactly. exactly quality of of anger that you could have there. It's, it's a very complex, um, uh, combustible uh, situation. Also, I've just noticed. I mean, I, I, I notice things as uh, as I talk. But if we look at this horror thing of Saturn. I mean, the two Saturns will, of course, be similar, but of course, this is astrology. So it's also close to her MC, um, and we all know what that relates to, opposite Jupiter, and then his Pluto. So, I mean, there is this extraordinary, who's going to take control of this relationship? It's very much, because Pluto to me is very much to do with primordial energy, and it will not be led, whereas Saturn will not tolerate disorder or primordial i mean it wants to basically control um somebody keeps trying to message me so i'm going to get that rid of that so we have a conflict here of control issues as well well i mean that that could dominate the rest of this conversation but i'm just drawing attention to yet further yeah. problems within the relationship it is and i just have a sense here looking at this and and of course knowing her status um that she really did expect to be to be queen I and mean, i don't mean literally expects to be queen but within the relationship expects to be queen absolutely and that, that's a that's a brilliant observation and when we look at the the two the two final charts um i think you're going to see something very interesting <laughs> because what we're going to look now is what direct spiritual purpose was was from one party 
to the other party. So we're looking at the draconic purpose on the tropical chart, okay? So look at, let's look at the first. So what we've got here is the inner wheel is Princess Margaret's tropical chart, and the outer wheel is um, the draconic purpose. In other words, what spiritual purpose was available as potential towards Princess Margaret? Now, what's interesting is dear old Lilith won't go away. Um, what we've got is his draconic Lilith is even in a more difficult situation of sitting, um, albeit out of sign, but we can allow it, on um, her Saturn and, prof and uh, Midheaven. And of course, it's also opposite um, Mars and the IC. Again, this is a variation on what we've seen in the other charts, but it's actually interesting that I don't know how you see this, but it's almost quite challenging to her status. You know, you said she expected to be queen in the relationship, yeah. but that's not likely to happen if you've got Lilith instead of the crown. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you think about it, hmm. it's, it's often difficult to deal with an older brother or sister. It certainly is. And here we have a situation where the, the family's position makes that even harder yes. because no matter how brilliant you are you are never going to be queen your sister is going to be queen mm -hmm. and i think that this is a very um, unique position to be in there's not many people in the world who are in that position of looking at their elder sibling and knowing that no matter what you do status wise you're never going to be equal let alone um, absolutely or overtake and i i just look at that saturn conjunct the mc there and i that's i there's a harshness to it you know and because that disappointment especially for a Leo, uh, that disappointment I th is you can't even express it because how could you express that? Because your expression of disappointment would be like expressing disappointment over the fact that the moon is not full every day. It's just <laughs> the way it is. So there's no room to complain there's no room to say woe with me because that is just the way it is and saturn doesn't doesn't deal with emotion um very gently either and here you've got somebody who's got the moon conjunct pluto you know the the myth of inanna is coming to my mind as i speak <laughs> and and so and so here it is and it's probably really buried deep this because she's not really allowed to expect uh, express it it's mm. just there. And, and then you've got this relationship that comes along. And maybe it was meant to be the opportunity to be queen. And he, maybe he had other ideas. <laughs> well, I think certainly Lilith is there to provoke. I mean, it's challenging the Capricorn energy, as you say. I mean, she Kind of, I mean, interesting you say she expected to be queen. She certainly expected to be queen on her royal progresses. You know, people would have, I mean, they sent ahead a list of things that she required, which usually involved a lot of gin. But also when she stopped eating at table, everyone else had to stop eating. So it was a very kind of um, strange entitlement. But I think what's interesting about Lord Snowden is that he openly mocked her. He would mock her socially. I mean, it's a cruel thing. I'm not saying it was the right thing to do. But you talked about fury, and now it's in a fiery sign, you know, draconic fiery mm -hmm. sign. So although, I mean, we, we both know life is pitiless. And it may be that there was a certainty or a um, expectation in her that life was, through this relationship, giving her an opportunity to reflect upon maybe to understand that maybe it's not a, such a great thing because Lilith wants to expose something. And uh, whatever Lilith wants to do, it is disposited by a Jupiterian energy. 
So there is the potential for growth with this energy, you see. So I'm not saying that worked. I don't think it did work. I think life basically failed <laughs> or she failed. But that, I mean, the other interesting thing, Anna, is that um, her, her Lilith out over in the 11th house is um, conjunct his draconic Venus. So this is a hint to me draconically that whatever's playing out between them will be through um, relationship. Although in Aquarius, um, of course, Aquarians can have happy relationships, but there is going to be a distancing involved. I mean, it's not the most passionate of signs. It's really an intellectual sign. So the nature of the lesson to be learned has to do with becoming more self-conscious, I feel. But I don't think that she did, to be honest with you, uh, thinking about the trajectory no. of her life. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at her North Node in Aries again and, and thinking about a, a remit that you come in with. Mm. Um, and the remit may well be to learn how to be assertive and how to be an individual yes. and how to be, and of course, she's a Leo anyway. So that, that's like an echo of that, um, the need for individuality, the need to be your own authority, the need to be a pioneer, the need to be, to be um, strong. But we can't forget the South Node. It, as we move towards that North Node, we can't forget the, the good things we've learned it's, I, I believe it should be a balance between the two. And it seems to me that I'm not entirely sure that there was a great deal of balance achieved. No, and, but isn't it interesting, there's a literal truth there. Uh, if you look at that North Node in Aries in the first house, it's, it's conjunct his draconic moon, which yes. in a literal sense is the new family that he provides her, or, you know, the potential for it. Um, and in a sense, it's the right end of the axis. But it's all bound up with the other themes that we've already identified. And it's also interesting to see that his draconic Neptune, um, which is exactly conjunct the descendant there, is almost um, exactly conjunct her moon, taking in her Pluto. Um, but just focusing on the moon, um, I think, at one level, this points to the illusory nature, potentially, of their relationship, but also um, of the potential inspiration that he could be to her. Um, it just didn't happen because of other things, other considerations. It's made me think of a hall of mirrors, you know. Do you think so? That's interesting. Yeah, the, the distorted imagery, images mm. uh, of projection onto yes. the yes. other. That's what it's made me think about. Um, well, this is certainly fascinating. I was just, of course, re reminding myself there that that South knows in Libra, but so is Venus too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was almost as though Venus in Libra is saying, remember the good stuff of Libra too, as you move towards Aries, harmony, balance. Um, <laughs> but, but sadly, I think this was, um, not to be <laughs> it was not to be the final let's move to the final chart which reverses things so we're now looking at uh, lord snowden's the inner world tropical chart and the other chart is princess margaret's draconic chart so the question here is what spiritual purpose or other purpose did she bring to his i have to say to you straight away anna and this is going to sound awful and i'm sure it wouldn't have occurred to anybody but i think that there was a strong status element a materialistic sort of role that she played in his life although one can spiritualize it one sees it in the obvious sense right at the top with the um the saturn mc on her um on his part of fortune and the mc so we have a literal elevation here but also seemingly in control until you look <laughs> what's happening below all this oppositional energy so you know that it's not going to be a straightforward uh, reign um, but in the literal sense, there is a hiking of status through her and an expansion of his world. But as I say, you also have all this opposition um, and all the rest of it. it. It seems to me, looking at that, as though it's, it's, it's like she's a vehicle for that moon Jupiter in the fourth. Yep. 
Absolutely. And, and so there's this vehicle there. And I'm not in any way suggesting that this was a conscious decision on his part, uh, but we, but it may have been at least unconsciously part of the attraction. It's the, the glamour of the status um, I would say that absolutely would be seductive. That. I'm afraid to say, I and mean, of course we go back to that, that illusory nature in their tropical chart. I mean, I'm gonna point something else in a minute, but the, it's interesting that it's that hall of mirrors idea that you have, the illusion, seeing what you want to see in each other, but also serving some pragmatic purposes. I mean, it's also quite interesting to me that his um, draconic Jupiter is on her tropical IC and also taking all that Gemini energy down in the fourth. Yeah. And mm. uh, so further elevation, I'm not making any allegations. But then, you know, we, we keep talking about illusion and disillusion, all these words, and he's a, we're talking about a Pisces. We're talking about a Pisces. <laughs> we're talking about a Pisces with this moon, uh, with this sun Venus conjunction and so it it's it's like it's screaming at us this this theme it's screaming to the point where i've got tinnitus <laughs> um i think it is interesting too anna that if we look at his draconic uranus oh and i find this over and over again in the charts of the royals like queen and prince philip your his uranus is on her son but opposed by her venus because in the draconic chart, her Uranus and Venus are, uh, are in opposition, which usually indicates huge restlessness, huge incompatibilities in the manner of relationship. And it's in the first of seventh axis as well. So we have very disruptive energy, albeit in Pisces, but then you've got dear old Virgo, implacable Virgo, although it's a mutable sign, but it is an earth sign as well. And it's also linked to analysis shall we say so i mean what i've written here yes he literally changed the course of her life in one sense um but of course neptunian energy again yes and virgo is the realist you see so there's that conflict between the dream and the waking up bit so what I've just to summarize, and then I'll, I'll stop talking. Overall, there's a strong materialist effect on his life with the potential spiritual growth only where the trappings of status or fantasy, I could add, are largely disregarded or seen through. There is a need for immense freedom within this bond, which they did not give to each other. She wanted him by his side all the time and he wanted her to be someone else. Yes. Hmm. Makes so you there. think. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall I stop the share, or do you, would you like to say something? More? Um, no, I, I think I, I'm kind of deep in thought. I haven't got much to say just at the minute. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's okay. Um, uh, part two, maybe. Um, but uh, so that's, I mean, so what we see, I mean, I think I said to you once before, maybe I didn't, maybe I said it to someone else. I mean, when I talk about draconic as to do with sole purpose, I think people are expecting a fortune cookie two-liner, you know, if only, if only. And what I try to encourage people in draconic analysis, please don't ignore the tropical. It's, it's not an either or, or an alternative. It's a growth. It's, it's a supplementary specialist thing. Like you put it magnificently when we spoke about draconic last time. And you said that it's rather like applying a microscope over a certain feature of your life and then expanding that into the draconic chart. And I can't improve. In fact, I stole that description and put it in my book. Delighted to hear it. <laughs> um, I was actually just thinking about evolutionary astrology and wondering where this fits in, because the way I see it is that it's a, an additional tool to use to un understanding evolutionary astrology. So I guess what I'm feeling is that draconic astrology is uh, a branch of evolutionary astrology. Do you feel that? 
I'll tell you something, it's interesting coincidence this, um, when I was putting together the new issue of Astrological Journal, which is, you know, I edit, the, it'd be the September, October, I was having a chat with um, Roy Gillett, the president of the AA, and he had just come back from the States and he was, he'd had a conversation about my book with Morris Fernandez, the former president of um, the Organization for Professional Astrologers. And he's written a book about evolutionary astrology. And we're publishing an extract about it in the magazine. And I don't know whether I'm right in thinking this, and you can correct me on this, because I've not made a great study of evolutionary, but there are great similarities. The big difference maybe is that it adopts more the idea of past lives and reincarnation, because the evolutionary thing may exceed the physical boundaries of this life. Well, I don't know. I think it depends on who you're talking to. And right. I refer you to Patricia Walsh, who's of the um, Forest School and um, who would, whose wonderful book, um, whose name escapes me. But for if you're interested, please um, have a look on, um, actually it's on Spotify still from the old light ways, uh, the interview that I did with Patricia. Um, about this very, very subject. And, um, and it, her wonderful book, uh, whose title you will find in the description box there, um, is all about the fascinating work she's done with past life regressions oh. and how it tallies to Pluto in the chart. Um, so um, this is... you know, a really important um, piece of work. And it's something that I've found when I've been working with past life regressions in the charts and looking at Pluto. She looked specifically at Pluto and the role of the nodes as um, indicators for past life experiences and the, the evolution that the soul is seeking in this particular lifetime. So um, I, it's, um, it's a wonderful, a wonderful book as well. I think there is a tie up. I think it's an unintended one, but I think there are convergent points. If you look at Pam Crane's book, The Draconic Chart, which I do recommend people read in addition to mine, of course, the Chasing the Dragons book. Um, but it's interesting that she combines a Christian faith with certain um, other ideas to do with reincarnation. Um, I'm not saying she goes heavily on the past life theme in her book, but she nonetheless addresses it. Whereas I'm much more agnostic and I talk more about default positions that we're born with. We may be born with certain talents, certain inclination, but we are, we know that as a fact. It's just that we can't rationally know where they come from. But I'm always interested in any system that brings to life that theme of past lives and reincarnation. I, I think so. And I'm, I'm actually just looking um, to see if I can find the name of the book, but I can't you just... You can I can't just um, off the top of my head, but actually, okay. I've read, I'll find it. Um, it's um, it's not Stephen Forrest that Patricia is linked with, um, although Stephen also it has the uh, the School of Evolutionary Astrology in his, right. his own right, um, and he also looks at Pluto, and in fact, he's coming back on Lightway specifically to talk about that um, in the near future. It's um, it's Diva Green and her father that are linked with Patricia Walsh. I see. Uh, okay. Jeffrey Wolf Green. That's the so and and that's the link with Patricia Walsh. And yes, absolutely, it encompasses um, the idea of reincarnation and past lives. Um, so okay. I think that's um, that's worth. But as I'm, but I can't get that out of my mind as I'm listening to you because I feel that. If we're looking at evolutionary astrology, um, and yes, I understood what you were saying before, where where it wasn't so much a, about past lives, but I think for for many evolutionary astrologers, we can't not look at past lives. Oh, yeah. And what I what I feel listening to you is that this is like another branch that's opening up um, uh, as a. Absolutely. An, an additional tool to understand the soul's progress. And you can't talk about the soul's progress in my mind, if you're not talking about, you know, 
reincarnation and past lives. You're missing. You're missing out on something. I think is what I'm saying. Yes, I, I consciously. It's not that I actively disbelieve anything, or in fact, I'm not really interested in believing or disbelieving. I mean, it's just a feature of my character. I'm more interested in dealing with what I already know. And astrology has this wonderful area of knowledge that we can be rigorous about, but then this is out of thing that we may call evolutionary or esoteric or whatever word you want to use, which begs the question, where do we come from and where are we heading? Exactly. And, and you must read my book, People. <laughs> I Did you like that <laughs> shift? That, 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 you know, I shifted from the sublime to the not so ridiculous. <laughs> Well, I will, I, I, I would heartily um, echo your plea there, um, because it's, it's a, it's a heartfelt recommendation. And, um, and so I will be putting a link to the AA conference on the description box, Thank you. because of course, I would urge all of you to go and do that. And um, it's great, it's all online. And I'm all delivering the plenary opening talk so everybody's invited millions of people will be tuning in and looking baffled except of course I will be giving a lot more color than I have done in terms of things that were said during the relationships I there's even a warning saying the language could get challenging yes indeed so I think it's it, Victor is a, a part of and I have seen the list of speakers uh, this year and um, I'm arranging to have a few more on um, to um, remind everyone that this is a wonderful event. And so the link to that is also going to be in the description box. Thank and you. I think if people would like to um, contact you, Victor, how do they do that? The website, victoroliver.co.uk, and that's Oliver with two L's. It's not Oliver Victor, and I'm not called Kevin. It's victoroliver.co.uk. <laughs> I'm not sure where Kevin came in there. Nor do I, but I've been addressed, dear Kevin. Sometimes it's dear Carol, and there or dear Oliver. And, I can understand um, the Oliver bit, having fallen prey to that trap, usually on <laughs> Facebook, because for some reason, when I see your name written down, I fall into that. It's like feels like it's a because little... I, I'm self-effacing. <laughs> uh, you know, my I've got a Neptunian moon, so I, in many ways I'm like a will of the wisp, and that's why people can't remember my name. They can't hang a label on me. What is he? <laughs> well, on that note, I thank everyone for watching. And um, next time we're going to be looking more at history once again, as um, we look at the history seminar that's coming up at the Astrological Lodge in early September. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about astrology, I am doing a fabulous new course called Working with the Gods. Um, and we are going to be looking at the outer planets and also the in-between Saturn and um, and Jupiter as well uh, coming up in September. Also, if you're newish to astrology or you are not new, but you feel like you'd like a recap, I'll also be doing that in September. So do get in touch and until next time, Goodbye. Bye-bye.